So what about if there will be questions from Facebook and other places? Can you read it? Can you see the Facebook? So in, in case people will be asking questions so that you'll be able to read it and ask those questions too. Yes, I think my Facebook is connected. I'm going to share the video to the to the group and there are some who will come in to, to participate and pose yes. their questions. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think it's important that they have access to. All right. So you will uh, when the Facebook is on, we'll let you know. Right, so that okay. I will introduce you, then you can now start and okay. then you will uh, introduce the whole idea. idea. All right, okay. The, the we do it as a form of interview. Yes, you were my, you were my guest. All right, yes, okay. yes. Okay. You people will let us know when the Facebook is on. Uh, we are on on YouTube now, but we are not yet on on Facebook. Okay. So once the Facebook is on, then we'll let you know. Is the is it okay? Is this showing or you have to connect something? Okay. I'm going to go back here. Okay. Just don't cut him off. So that it will be better saying. Shake you shake you or something. So that why are we not on on Facebook yet? We're not taking time. Okay. All right. Let's uh, try and welcome everybody that is going to join us. We're going to welcome everyone. Uh, let me see if we have people on Facebook that are joining us. We, I know we already have people on YouTube, so we'll go on Facebook now. It's going to be a, a very interesting conversation today. Uh, I'm having with uh, Honorable Vincent Magaji. Innocent Magaji, Innocent Magaji. Innocent Magaji is, uh, is a self-proclaimed atheist or agnostic that is, uh, but who is indifferent, who is not indifferent to the truth, who is very interested in the truth, and who is, um, who wants his, uh, himself and his friends to come to the awareness of the truth and to challenge me and find out why should I choose Christianity? Why should I even choose to believe in Christianity being an African? So he has a lot of questions. We already started to discuss with him personally, but what I've understood from Vincent is that he's not the only one, I mean, from Innocent, sorry, is that Innocent is not the only one who has similar questions as a, as an atheist and as uh, as a, as um, uh, agnostic, that uh, that you know Christianity is outdated, and uh, somebody also informed me that a lot of children and a lot of pastors' children now in Nigeria are refusing Christianity and are rejecting Christianity, and uh, they are rejecting Christianity because of the way uh, the so-called fathers have practiced Christianity in Nigeria. So as a result of that now, many people are becoming atheists. Many people are becoming atheists. So the question is, uh, I would like to introduce to you people uh, Innocent Magaji, but he has a whole group of people, a whole group of uh, agnostics and atheists who are on his platform and on his group, in his group, Facebook group. Um, those people too have similar questions that they will all be asking me. So, but uh, I will allow him to be the host today. So, Innocent is going to be the host of this program. And anybody that has any comments or questions or contribution, uh, I'm sure Innocent will be glad to for you people to participate and write your contributions or comments or questions. Write them on 
the comment section on the YouTube or Facebook. And uh, so, uh, Mr. Innocent uh, Magaji, over to you. You are in charge for the next one hour, one and a half hours. Thank you so much. And good evening to everyone that is listening to us and to those that are watching online and those that will still watch in the future times. Is This conversation is really, really important to me because I've been battling with Christianity. I grew up in a Christian family and uh, I lost my faith. And I discovered that recently the numbers of people who are coming up to embrace this atheism and agnosticism is increasing day by day. So Dr. Sonja Adelaja is my mentor, and I consider him as my mentor because I admire him a lot because of the in-depth of what he has in his mind. And I follow, I've been following his teaching since 2016, till 2016, I guess, yes, till today. So I've been really inspired with his teachings. And he's not just the regular Nigerian pastor that you know, he's more of that. He, he's, he teaches things that are more practical. He doesn't just... Like the regular Nigerian pastor that you know, and all the pastors everywhere, they seek to deliver, to to bring salvation to your soul. But Dr. Sonia Adelaja doesn't just save your soul. He saves both your soul and your body. And that's what attracted me to him in the first place. So I became very interested. We engage in so many conversations. And uh, I get to, I read some of his book, and I've been following all his teachings, and I get to see that he's totally different, and he's introducing a unique version of Christianity. So... Being that, I love the truth, and with the atheist organization, the community that we have, I noticed that we are not just people that are interested in dogmas or doctrines or just with a rigid mindset. We are open to fact. We are open to, to reality. We are not just, we don't just dismiss the existence of a God. We need to prove that's what it is. So I noticed that this community is full of intelligent individuals who have studied a lot, and then they understand this concept of Christianity, and most of them were actually Christians. We have Muslims among us. And now, what is it about atheism, agnosticism in Africa currently? We have different aspects. We have different group of people that are already together with us. There are some who claim to be animists. There are some who claim to be humanists. There are some who claim to be atheists. There are some who claim to be agnostics. And all these people together, they have one common objective. The objective is to fight religion, to fight Christianity. The, 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 the Christianity and Islam in Africa. So we all have one thing that we share in common, it's called Afrocentrism. And this Afrocentrism is to protect our culture, to protect our identity. So we have had this conversation in the past, and so many people expressed their view, which most of us share. So I discussed with Dr. Sindhya Adelaja a few times, and I discovered that he is spread by to some of the books, some of the ideology that promote Afrocentrism. So what amazes me is why did he still stick? Why, is, why does he adhere to this Christian? principles is what pricks my curiosity for me to call him to organize this talk today. So I hope that we can be able to learn and be able to understand because his personal experience, he traveled and spent a lot of time in Ukraine. He has the largest church currently in, in, in Europe. So it's something really, really interesting to be able to understand the in-depth of his mind. I, I As I'm talking to you right now, I was nervous from the beginning before organizing this, I was I was thinking about something. I it's not it's not it's not a form of challenge, but I wanted to understand. I was curious. I don't I don't just know why you still subscribe to this Christian version, and why do you think it's important for other people to be able to see it? Because you said something. I was watching one of your video in a very long time. You say something about that faith is a weapon. You say it's an asset. In one of the Nigerian transmission video you made, you say faith is a weapon, it's an asset in man's hand. So when I watch your life, through you demonstrated humility in most of your Facebook live video, you the way you, you treat people, and most especially the first time I wrote you was on Facebook, you replied swiftly without any delay, and I was shocked. Because I, when I came across your video, I went on to make some research about you, and I found that there are so many incredible things about you. Then I was like, I'd already made a conclusion in my mind that, oh, this man is so powerful. I'm not even sure he's going to reply to my message. Let me just write him. I was actually impressed with what I saw. Then I wrote, swiftly, you replied. I was like, okay, this is it. Then I, I went on 
We talked a few times. I saw the humility in you. I saw the people around you that are growing. And then I went to discover that you have influenced a lot of life. You have changed family. You have saved a lot of life. You, you people that are addicted to drugs, to alcohol, you gave them hope in life. You were able to build this, uh, to build this energy, to gather this respect around you, and you were able to help each other. Then I uh, help other people. Then I said to myself, okay, this is me. I'm here criticizing Christianity because of everything that Christianity has done to Africa. My people are dying of ignorance, superstition, and all sorts of things. And here is somebody that is uniquely different, somebody that always oh, took a different stand and is able to use Christianity to pass positive message. Then something came to my mind. Then I realized that, yes, this same Christianity, this same Bible, people can use it to promote negative messages. They can use it for their selfish interests. They can use it to achieve whatever. They, they can use it to manipulate people. They can use it to make people to kill each other. They can even use it to start a war. They can even use it to commit a genocide. We have record of some of those things in the Bible. We have record of the Amorite, the killing of the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Amalekite, the Jebusite, the Cushite, how they were being massacred by the Israeli. So this has been a point of concern to most of us atheists, to have no six, the enemies, the Christ group in Italy. It has been a very huge point of debate. We have been asking ourselves, why is the Bible full of violence? Why is it so? We have a God who we order, uh, we just decide to just wake up one day and kill every male child, the firstborn. I'm talking about the children of the Egyptians because he wants to save his people. He will harden the heart of Pharaoh. So some of us, we are past Christians. We read this, this book. Some who are into Islam understand how this religion of prayer. But here is somebody, Dr. Sindhya Adelaja, using this same Christianity to promote good ideas. I'm, I'm saying it to those who don't know much things about him yet. Please, I urge you to be humble, to go on and make a lot of research before you give any, before you pass any judgment, to try to understand the work and where he's coming from. As I'm talking to you right now, I'm very, very humble in my spirit because I come to respect the person of Dr. Sunday Adelaja. He has done a lot of things through Christianity. So coming to interview you, I don't see any reason why I shouldn't support your cause. I don't see any reason why I shouldn't support your movement because I've seen the marvelous work you have done. I've seen how you've touched life and you make me humble personally myself. So I'm really, really impressed. So what I really want to understand is I ask myself certain questions. I say, okay, are you going to, what is your aim? First of all, you save people, you give them hope, but will it, is it going to be for a very long time or is it going to be for a very short time, this, this Christianity? Because I noticed that you are preaching this version of Christianity. How will it, are people going to create another new doctrine out of it or are they going to be able to liberate their mind? Then I watched around you too and I saw that the disciples, some of your students, some of the people around, Dr. Success, Dr. Amu, Mayowa, the people around, I've seen their improvement and their development. I've seen the way they question things and I concluded to myself that you're not a type that's sick to indoctrinate people or try to teach them what to think, but you teach them how to think rather. So, and I said to myself, I said that the people that will relate with you deeply, the people that you won't have any difficulties, if they come to realize who you are at the atheist, because they are, for instance, our kind of ambience in Africa, where it's very superstitious, it's very difficult to find a child that will grow in that community to be able to think independently against all, all oppression, stereotype, when you, you claim that you're an atheist, for instance, we have one of our members who is called Mubarak Bala. He's a Muslim from, from the north. He, he was being castigated by his parents. Some of them thought he was even mad. They even took him to a psychiatric home. So you find a place where you, uh, you claim to be an atheist, you present yourself, and then here you are with your family who are religious and the people around you, they start considering as somebody that is sick they don't understand why an individual will start saying that you don't believe in the existence of God anymore. But these individuals did not just come to that conclusion in one night. They, it happens through constant research, through studies. They see they are frustrated with the environment. They are frustrated with their ground, with everything that is going on. So they just want to say, okay, well, let me search other alternatives. These are high people. They think fast. They think beyond their culture, they think beyond their community, they think beyond what they are taught. So I say, if all the atheist community will listen to you 
they will relate to you more quickly. It will be even easier for you to convince the atheists than the religious people that are currently in Nigeria because the, your method of teaching is more logical, it's more practical. You teach things, you want things to be done. You do not just ask people to wait for supernatural power to come and make things happen through magic. You empower people both physically and spiritually. How do you do how do you heal people psychologically by giving them hope, by making them to understand that through a lot of people that have abandoned drugs, which is something really, really commendable that I have I, I, after seeing that I was very, very humble with that. So right now, here we are discussing with this group of people, the atheists, the animists, the agnostics. Why? How do we try to understand what is their own mindset and what, what is the problem? What led to them becoming this? I say this because I went through the same process myself from Christianity to Islam, from Islam to atheism, from atheism to agnosticism where I am today. And I consider, I want to say this to those who are listening to me, that I consider atheism personally, that's my own personal view, but men, I know many will argue this, that most of us do not just, we don't have problem with God. The only problem we have is with the concept of God. Most of us are very much aware that there is a transcendent energy, a force, a power beyond human comprehension. We believe in science, we believe in so many things, metaphysics. But the only problem we have is the concept of God, how God is being presented. We do not want to see a God that is jealous, a God that is full of hatred, a God that is vengeful, a God that kills, a God that supports another group of people, and a God that he has fans using some kind of clan. So it's the main debate today that I will say concretely is the concept of God. And I have friends that are atheists that are full of arrogance. Today, if you ask them, they will think that God doesn't exist. They will just dismiss it directly. But I consider such state of mind as being puerile because atheism, as it is today, is childish, is puerile. It's the, is the, I, 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 I will, I will, I will use this word, I will say, is an immature state of agnosticism. Because those who graduate from the level of atheism to become agnostics are very, very difficult to be convinced. Because first of all, they went through that gradual process of debating this concept of God in their mind. They, they, they go through turbulent process. They say, no, God doesn't exist, okay. And then they realize that, okay, they're actually fighting the concept of a God, not actually God himself. They are, right now, they will tell you that they are not, they don't deny that there is a supernatural power. They will tell you that they don't deny that there is a force that is controlling this. And they, don't, they will tell you that, of course, human beings can be able to, like I'm talking to you currently, you are in Ukraine, I'm in France here, but we can still communicate because somebody had the intelligence to gather elements, matter, combine them together to be able to foster an energy that could be able to permit us to communicate now. So if you if you call it witchcraft, they won't understand it. But if you employ the word science, it's very easy for them to understand it. If somebody is performing magic on the stage today, doing something, if you say, if you say it's magic, they will start arguing with you. But if you, tell them, if you try to explain the scientific process that in, involve an individual, fixing an element from different angle to different angle to create energy, to generate electricity, to generate calls from coming people from different continents. They will understand you once you start using scientific language. So the general debate today is actually the concept of God, this Christian concept of God, with us promoting our procentism. For instance, in the question, in the question that I've generated, there are 15 questions, and five questions each touch different aspects, which I believe you very much you're in a position to answer this because the first aspect is the spiritual aspect of God, the concept of God. And then the second aspect is the cultural aspect of Christianity, how it affects uh, Africa, how it's related to the African culture. And then the third aspect is the economic aspect. Because most, mostly, most of us think that religion only solves spiritual problems. It only solves spiritual problem. It doesn't solve economic problem. It doesn't has anything culturally. It it, it comes to the, 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 this huge cultural decadence we see now in Africa. So, all atheists, all agnostics, all animists. This is one of the key points. This is their main fear in mind: spiritual aspect, cultural aspect, and economic aspect. If you propose an idea to them, they want to know how does this benefit them. They ask you a question. They will teach you about history of slavery. They will teach you about different how Christianity, how Christians are going around to burn shrines in Africa. Meanwhile, the very shrine that they're trying to burn, some of the activists that are found in that shrine, you come to Europe, you see them here in museums, well-preserved, 
If you're telling prisoners and people are coming from China to come and watch, to come and pay, they will come to the African Museum, like the one I saw in Paris. You will see all African artifacts, the same thing that we call juju in Africa, that people are afraid, that people venerate so much. When you come to Europe, you see them preserve it preciously in glasses with proper lightning. They keep good chemicals. They will ask you not to even use camera to snap some of them because it will damage them. So, but why is it that outsiders, foreigners, appreciate this African culture, this African art? They appreciate it a lot, but we Africans, we don't appreciate it. So the few people that are able to come out of this myopic mindset, which are the group of people that refer to as atheists now, they come to realize they did they, they, is a fast mind. It, it brings up a lot of questions. So they come to say, okay, all right, now this is it. We have to protect our culture. We have to protect our identity, our languages. And then we say, okay, now that Christianity is coming to destroy our art, so many Christians are going to punch lines. What do we do? And for instance, you are your name is Sunday now. You accept Christianity. You are a Yoruba person. There is even an example that is said that a Frenchman doesn't accept Chinese name. A Frenchman will never be called by Chinese name. They will never accept it because they understand the psychological impact it has on them. And a Chinese man will never be called by a French name. By a French name, a Chinese man cannot say Je m'appelle Nicolas Sarkozy or Je m'appelle François Hollande. And a, and a Frenchman cannot say Je m'appelle Xi Jinping or function or whatever they can because they understand the psychological effect behind as trivial as it is just changing of name adopting a foreign name as trivial as it is if we heard of somebody called Catherine you might think a Catherine is a European or an American but you don't know that this Catherine is very much an African and when you hear about Mohammed you might think this Mohammed must come from the Middle East is certainly an Arab, but you won't know that this Muhammad is actually an African, a black African. But because this individual accepted Christianity, they accepted Islam, they decided to adopt some of these foreign names that has cultural effect. It has a psychological effect. Psychologically, it affects them. There's a, there's a cultural cut up between the mind. It makes you, it, it, it seems banal, it seems trivial, it seems very, very much less important, but there is a psychological, like me currently, I decided I have a daughter, I say I want to name her an African name, or give her an African name, and I said, hey, be proud of it. If someone called you with this name, you tell them that this is a, this is a meaning, and because she was giving birth in the hospital close, close by here, and the doctor looked at me, she said, hey, innocent, yeah, you give it to your daughter in France, why can't you just give her a name? She said, give her some kind of French name. Uh, I said, why? She said, yeah. It's a very cool name. She said, what name would you like to give it to her? I said, well, uh, I don't know. I want her mother. What name will you give her? Her mother is a South African. So what name will you give to her? She said, well, I'll give her Tiseso. Tiseso, which actually means perseverance. I said, all right. Well, uh, me, I'll find a Yoruba name and give her. I said, I'll give her name Ayomi. I'll call her Ayomi by the name. So this thing, when it comes to names, it comes to culture, art, poetry, philosophy, poems, the atheist, organization, association, group, those who subscribe to this ideology are trying to protect this identity that they think that Christianity is coming to destroy. They are coming, they are saying within themselves that yes, we need to protect our ideas, we need to protect our culture because these people are coming to give us, they are replacing our names, they are replacing our language. I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking to you currently in English. So they are, they, they, there is that fear of cultural annihilation which they don't understand, first of all. And then you, the, the first aspect which I would like you to address is the spiritual aspect, which is you read the Bible, you don't see anything about God. You don't see, the Bible doesn't tell you where he, he lives, where he comes from. He, you only see his nature. You see him in different action. You see he's describing, first of all, the Bible starts with the creation of the world. So there are questions behind that who is God? And does God have a beginning? Does he have a beginning? And why do we need him in the first place? Why do we need him or her? So there's that question of gender when it comes to God. Is he a man or a woman? Is he black or is he white? So to the African atheists, that is something very, very important for them because if you tell them that God is white, okay, they have a problem with that. They will start telling you, all right, Okay, we know what the white man can do. We know how they enslaved some of our people. We know how they still continue to plunder African resources. So if you tell them that God is white, how is he? Does he have a gender? Does he have a race? 
how does he look like? He's something that is really, really curious. Is he, does he have a human, human form? What does he look like? How does he behave? How does he talk? What does he come? So these are some of the curiosity. These are some of the things that start boiling up in our mind. We come to this and we say, okay, uh, well, we read the Bible and try to find the answer to it. We don't see the answer in the Bible. We don't see the answer in the Quran. We don't see the next thing. We just say, well, we think there's something wrong somewhere with the concept of God. And why does he choose, first of all, to to present himself through literature, through human literature. You know about the history of Christianity, how the Bible was compiled, how it was canonized by different, by Emperor Constantine and different stages that the Bible went through, different modification, the evolution of the Bible, the transliteration of the Bible. So coming to understand the history of how this book came to exist is something that is really, really challenging. So this atheist group, they come up with these questions in their mind, which I would like you to address first of all, the spiritual aspect, and then we'll go to the cultural aspect, and then the economic aspect. Who is God? Does he have a beginning? Why do we need him or her? And is heaven a real location where God resides, or just an inner realm of consciousness? Then what gender and what race do you ascribe to this very God? So these are the first five questions. I don't know okay. where did we start this. The way, the way I would like us to go is you have three categories, right? Yes. Three categories, five questions each. Yeah? Yes, yes. Okay. So let's start by asking those questions one by one. So we start with the spiritual category. You ask one question until mm -hmm. we answer all the five questions, then we we'll go to the other one. All right, okay. I would like you to take most of your time to address this because it's very important for, yeah. for them. So the first question... The question one by one, yeah. Okay. The first question is, who is God? Okay. Yes. That's the first question. That's it. Yes. No, yes. Gen no gender here. Gender will come later and all that, right? Yes, yes. Okay. This, this is five questions. Who is God? Who is God? The first one is God. Who is God? Yes. God is spirit, which takes us out of the limitations of man. Man is a matter, but God is not a matter, which makes man unqualified and incapable of defining God. Because God is spirit and man is not qualified and as is not matured enough. The maturity of God, the, that be of man, the intellect of man has not taken him to the fourth dimension. The, 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 in physics, the, the, we only have three dimensions first and second dimension. That's where men operate. But for us to locate God, we have to go to beyond the third dimension. We've got to go to the fourth dimension where is spirit realm. Now, the fact that the man cannot put spirit into the laboratory and confine spirit, that doesn't mean that spirit is non-existent. It is just like saying right now that an ant, if I find an ant or an insect, and an insect is seeing me approaching him, approaching it, and that insect or ant is trying to determine from its own parameter and from its own dimension how to define me uh, as a human. An ant cannot define a human. It doesn't have the parameter. It's not on the same level. It's just like saying, I cannot be using the same parameter that I use to define or to identify a product, physical product, that I will use the same parameter to identify and to, to, to define bacteria. Because bacteria are too small. I mean, they are too little for my for physical. They are not optical. Optical eyes cannot determine them. So, you, and, and because man is so limited to his senses, to his five senses, and to the things he can see, either through uh, physical eyes or through, you know, other uh, optical uh, instruments, we are so limited. We are too limited to even begin to know what is happening in the spirit realm. So, a man that is only reliant on his five senses and on physical and material reality 
to determine existence and to pass a mark and assessment to all reality, he has failed before he began. That is why I agree with you that when somebody is a pure atheist, it is easier to defeat him in an, the argument or debate than agnostics. Because an agnostic is trying to come out of being cornered. Because, for example, if, if an atheist will say, uh, if an atheist will say everything came out from the theory of the Big Bang, it will mean that that atheist or anybody who believes in the theory of evolution and Big Bang has contradicted the very basis of physics through which the Big Bang theory itself was discovered. It is physics that gave us the ability to discover the Big Bang theory. And that same physics tells us that everything comes to regression and you know entropy. Everything comes to, you know, this is disjointed and everything comes to destruction, natural destruction. Everything disintegrates. Everything comes from order to disorder. Things, that is how, that is physics. That is how life moves. Everything will eventually comes to this, come to this order from order. So, but things don't come automatically without external forces and external influence from this order to order. If you go to your room right now and your room is unpacked and scattered, things are scattered. If and you come back in the evening and everything is, the bed is made of, you know, the clothes are ironed, everything is hanged, it means there is an external influence. So when it comes to man, for man to function, elements, the eyes, why is the, the, our eyes not on the top of our head? There is a logic behind it. There's somebody logical that are putting that together. There, why is it that our mouth is not under our, our soul, the soul of our feet? It's because there is an intelligence right there. Why is it our nose is not at the back of our spine? There is an intelligent design, and not just for man, but for every creature. So since we cannot say, you know, just like you cannot come to your room that is disorderly, nothing, this is science. Nothing comes to, you know, order from disorder. Rather, if you will leave everything in the perfect order and you leave it without any external force and external control, it will eventually come to disorder because, you know, that is the natural sense of things. That is why entropy is a reality. Things get bad. Things get destroyed. So what is that external force? That external force is the force of God. And that is why that external force that is going to maintain and, and maintain creation and even create has to be more intelligent than the thing is creating. It's just like this iPad right now that I have. This iPad, there are somebody that created this iPad has to be more intelligent than the iPad itself. Because that person has to be able to think of the iPad, be able to gather it together, form way. So a, a, the, just the same thing like an art artist. An artist who draws a picture has to first of all conceive that picture. So that artist has to belong to another dimension, to another uh, you know, level of reality than the, than the picture that you are just painted. Just like the same, you no, know, and, uh, and the, the, you know, the dimension of of the of the metal and iPad is this first dimension, second dimension. But the man that created it has to be in a higher dimension, which is a third dimension. So this iPad or this book that I've written or this the, this tissue paper that is here cannot begin to discern me right now. So what is even the concept of life? If we have life, it means that the person who gave us life has something more than life. Something superior to life. That's why he is able to create life. If anybody is able, if a man, if man exists, and we know that it has to be a higher intelligence that creates man, it means that the person that made man to be man has to come from a higher dimension to be able to assemble man. Just like somebody who created this has to be higher to be able to assemble it. Somebody that created, wrote this book has to know something to be able to pack it together. You have to belong to a new dimension. That is the question of who is God. God is spirit. And God, because God is spirit, he cannot be dragged to the laboratory. And he cannot be assessed by an ant. 
of a man because he doesn't even believe he doesn't even belong to the same category and the same dimension as him okay that that leads us to the next question actually you landed just right in the next question because according to the logic you just gave and during the hmt the last hmt the january hmt program which just finished some weeks ago you show the video of the universe of the universe of the galaxy system you show the the, the milky way different galaxy and a lot of things that try to explain so uh, the, uh, is, this thing is leading to the next question. It explains the intelligence, the complexity, the nature, the magnitude, which human beings come to admit, whether religious or irreligious, it comes to explain that there is certainly a transcendent energy beyond the human comprehension, which you just described now, which we totally agree with you. So, creating human beings, like you said, eyes not being in the toe or in the, in the middle of the head, because there is a logic behind, there's, there's an intelligence, there, there's a design. And now when you bring out the human body, an autopsy, a yeah, human body, you put it on the table, you will see that there are thousands of muscles in the flesh of the human body. There are thousands of muscles that connect to the bone. And then you also ask yourself, why does a woman get attracted to a man? What is the need for that connection? What is behind these forces? What is behind this intelligence? Why? Is it they, certainly they, they, they can't come from? I just listen, right? yeah. I just listened to an atheist yesterday who yes. became a, a, as an atheist medical science scientist, not a medical doctor, but medical scientist. He does researches in the area of medicine, and mm -hmm. he said, "I became a believer only because of anatomy." He said, "Because when a man, a human body is opened up, the order at which everything functions together." The thousands of elements and everything functioning in perfect order, there must be somebody that knows all that arrangement. And that's how he became a believer. Well, and that told me he made him a believer. Yes. So, 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 so leading to that, yes, the human anatomy, it's incredible. It, the, the way the brain functions, the way certain animals. There is this example of a plant we, where you take this plant. We were talking recently about a French philosopher, they call him Michel Onfray, a very young man. He was talking about a certain plan of how you will take this plan. The plan actually has time in it. The plan will close in the evening. It will close, it leaves. But when it's daytime, the leaves open. So what they did was that they took this plant and put it in total obscurity, in a huge total darkness in the cave where there would be any access to any light at all. But this plant was able to close when it's night and open when it's daytime, even without having getting to know that is there any light or there is no any reflection of the sun. So watching the nature, watching the mountains, the force of the ocean, the power the strength, the earthquakes we experienced, certainly there must be an external force from all these things and the human anatomy too that is the complexity of the nature of the creator of all these things. So in your opinion, why do you think that such huge personality, such magnificent, such omniscient, such omnipotent personality, how do you come to the conclusion that his personality could be summarized in a little tiny book Call the Bible within the Jewish, the clan, a clanish movement, a group of people, just tiny. Let's say at the epoch, we, let's say we have at least, let's say five billion people, four billion people during the epoch when they were having this, they were the Africans, he didn't see the Africans to use them to make, make profit among the Africans. He didn't see the, the Europeans, he didn't see the, the Asians, they were the Chinese people, they had a very great civilization that existed in a very long time. So how could you subscribe to this little, tiny literature, just a book, how do you explain that this very book can explain the nature of this magnificent energy that is beyond human comprehension, this energy that created the human body, that created the galaxy, how can you explain that this book, the Bible, can explain its nature? All right. Now, when we talk about galaxy and the earth and the complexity of creation, that proves to us that there is an intelligent creation behind all this. You will see that man is so minute in creation process itself and in the complexity of creation itself that man is only but a tiny, tiny dot. In the, because let's take one galaxy for example any little galaxy and our galaxy Milky Way is one of the smallest but let's talk about 
any galaxy. Any galaxy you take is about 500 million times bigger than the planet Earth. Galaxy. The Earth. So if, if a galaxy is 500 million times bigger than the Earth itself, so that is less than a dot. That is less than a sand, a grain of sand. And if that is the case, then you want to ask yourself, then how many galaxies are there? There are more than 500 billion galaxies. So when we are talking about God, and God, this huge God, talking about huge God, we are not even talking, man is not even the most complex of his creation. It's the easiest of his creation. Man, let's take, let's take one galaxy that is, we are not even talking about the earth where man is, has not even been able, man has not even been able to explore the whole earth. We have not even explored 10% of the earth. In fact, man has not even been able to exploit 10% of man himself. More than that, man has not even been able to, able to exploit any part of the body of man. Man can, has not been able to exploit even the eye. Let's say you find a medical doctor. That says it's a medical doctor, a doctor or optician of uh, eye clinic, eye science. Med you even say it's a doctor, medical doctor. It is a wrong expression. You cannot be a medical doctor. You can only be a, a specialist in one little area. And when you say you are the, a, a doctor, doctor of science, PhD in eye treatment, you have to ask what part of it. <laughs> then if you say what part of it, then you have to ask what part of that one part. Then after, that is all the doctorate, PhD that we get. Let's say somebody comes to you and says that I am a pro PhD or professor of mathematics. It's not possible. You cannot be a professor of mathematics. Nobody can be. The whole world, nobody can be. You can only be a professor of maybe algebra. Maybe this one, this one. Even if you say algebra, we have to say, okay, from algebra, which one in that algebra? What department? What faculty? What? <laughs> so what I'm saying is that even the eye alone, if we gather, if we close down all universities in the world and tell them just to study the eye, they are still not going to be able to solve all the problems of the eye so that nobody will be blind, so that nobody will ever use glasses, so that any, every complexity will never be resolved. All universities in the world, they are not even able to resolve the problem of eye alone, or brain, or digestive system, or any part of the body you mentioned. We are just talking about body. So that kind of man that is so weak, that is so you know, helpless, but to even help himself, let him hold that man stop the question of death now. Let him solve the littlest question of when he's going to die or when he's going to be born. So man is so non-entity when we are talk talking about God. He decided that, okay, we are not even, I'm not even challenging the man to go and solve the problem of moon or, or, or sun or any star. Or the galaxy. I'm not even talking about the galaxy. I'm not even challenging man to go and say, when you finish studying one galaxy, one, then we can begin to discover the one who made the galaxy. <laughs> it is pride. It is pride that makes man to begin to think that he even qualifies to ask questions about God. Because when we say that the smallest galaxy is 500 million times bigger than the earth itself, and that there are 500 billion galaxies that are much more complex. So what is Earth that we cannot even explore? We have not even explored 1% of the Earth. Talk less of ourselves. We are, you've not even discovered yourself. You are, what are you running to? Okay, right now, some people want to go to Mars. Okay, can we get to Mars? You know, the biggest optical, uh, you know, invention of whatever... Uh, <coughs> The me me mechanism that NASA has uh, inst installed and discovered to get to the mass, for you to send somebody to the mass, you have to, I mean, we are still struggling with it. Up to that, we can still not design, just to go. <laughs> we are not even talking about song. We can get to die. You know, we are so finite. We are so limited. We, that is because we belong to another category. Now, so what, the question about God, is how can then we say 
this small book called the Bible would describe God. Of course, it cannot describe God. The God man is the littlest and the weakest of all God's creation. But the only thing, magic, magic work that God gave to make man special, even though it's the simplest, but is this most is the most unique, is that God puts his nature, his spirit, just little spirit in man, little. God himself is the whole spirit though, that is controlling all those about 500 billion galaxies. It's everywhere. But in man, when a man dies, it is less than one kilogram. One, in fact, it's six grams. Only six grams of our life, the life of a man that lives with a man died. It's only six grams of breath. That life of a man is just like six grams. It's, it weighs less than this thing. This my uh, this one. It weighs then less than we are so non-entity. It is that little six gram that God put in man that makes us to be different and to be able to even think. It is that little gram that makes man to become homo sapiens. Because it is only when the breath of God, that little, that breath, that is the six gram. <laughs> when it met with the with the shape of man and the 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 the, the body of man. When the spirit of God made it, became man became a thinking man. So that faculty of the man to think is what the limited little thing that is needed for him to manage the earth and to rule over the earth is what is deposited in him. Just is only the little that is needed for him to survive and manage the earth and be lord over all the creation on the earth is what is given to him. So also with the Bible, God only put little, as little as necessary for man to function in relationship with God to, to only to the end, as to the concept of the earth, for him to be able to relate with God and manage the earth. That is the only little information that is contained in the Bible about, uh, for, for, man, for man about God. Man, the Bible is too small to reveal God. Only we have only the only the more the more that is there is the more I mean the much we need to function on the earth and the more we need to, the much we need to know about him. That is just you just you just like say you will not give your son now, for example, a hundred billion dollars and he's only one year old. He doesn't need that. Even though you have that money, but you are giving him just a glass of you know this, a glass of that, he doesn't even need the one ten dollars. It would, you know, if you give him more than that, it would destroy him. So, when to say that, how can that little bo be, uh, book describe God? No, that book doesn't represent God. It only gives us a little understanding of God. The little for our good that is enough, good enough for us. That the most we need to know. To function on the earth and to relate with God. That's it. And to relate with all creation. And then why is it that it is the it is not the African man that God put or used? Because everything, if you follow the order of creation, everything is done with I you know with everything starts with a prototype. God had the whole earth on earth, on, on, on in mind when he was creating choosing, when he wanted to relate to man. He wanted to relate to the whole earth and to all nations, all colors. But he needed a model. Just like we all do. Before this iPad was created, one, one original copy, one model needed to be created. When you buy a Mercedes-Benz, the reason why you have Mercedes-Benz is because there was a model, a prototype of that Mercedes-Benz that has been tested. Test run. That's why we now have all the Mercedes-Benz that you have. That is how life is. Something has to be started with something. That is why God started with the Jewish people. And there is a reason for it. Okay, you, you are saying, why is it that God didn't use, uh, you know, the, is it the white, no, Africans or the white people or... The Asians, the Chinese. Asians, Chinese. There are a lot of reasons and a lot of comple com com complexity. For example, let's take the Chinese. The Chinese people, up till... like 2,000 years ago, they were busy killing themselves. Go and read this story of the Chinese people. They were busy fighting, infighting. 
Now, people who are one tribe against the other, they just kept on fighting all their lives. So people who are busy killing themselves like that, there is no way for them to be able to settle down to carry, you know, the, the image of God or the likeness of God or the model, the prototype of God. Now, even these Jewish people will say, why did, is, it they, is it that they are the one that was chosen? No, there was another civilization, which was the patient civilization. The Jewish people were chosen from the from Ur, from Pesatomania, what do you call it? You know, there is the Pesatomania, what do you call it? So, they, from the Persian civilization. So, they came out from the Persian civilization. That is where God instructed Abraham to leave the Persian civilization. And from one man who is a, who is a Persian, God created the Jewish people. Yeah, Mesopotamia, wait, Meso, Meso, Mesopotamia. Yeah, Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia. So that is where he got him from. So he's not like Jewish people. No, Jewish people is a new people compared to the Chinese people, compared to, you know, the other, you know, like the Persian people from that Mesopotamia, for example. So he's just one person. Now, if God has chosen a black person, the same question will have arisen. Why that black person? If it had been a white person, why that white person? But I think God chose between the two. We not neither white nor black. It's just yellow in, in between the two. But then God also gave explanation. It's like God knew that this question was going to arise. And so God gave explanation as to why Abraham was the one that was chosen. And he said the reason is because this Abraham, I saw a quality in him, which is he has the ability to pass down he will teach his next generation the principles of the knowledge of God that I gave to him. So because I can trust him to pass down the knowledge of God, because that knowledge of God was needed, despite all the crisis and the trouble they were going to pass through, it was needed for them to keep it and pass it across. Why was it needed? Because they were only the prototype. They were supposed to keep that knowledge of God for us. They had to go through a lot of suffering in learning to walk with God and the ways of God to become a model for us, all other nations and other countries, so that by studying the original, the prototype and the model and the, uh, uh, you know, the modus operandi of God with man, so that all nations also now could observe that and also copy and learn without paying the price of years and the price of punishment and suffering that the Jewish people had to go through to be able to be that model people and model nation that, you know, that portrays God's relationship to man to the rest of the world. So it is actually a liability and a responsibility rather than a privilege. But with that responsibility comes some certain privileges, which is a blessing, the blessings of Abraham. It's, it's really interesting the word you use. You see, the Bible is very literal. It is a very literal, the knowledge of God, just portion of it. That's a very strong word. And I admire, I just feel, I just feel why, why you use that word. It's, I was waiting to hear about that. And this narrative, of a, of a privilege, of a model of the Jews, it's actually bemused me, and I'm wondering why does God have to go through such hectic way to reveal himself to humanity? Why does he have to take all this long process of um, people to kill some group of people? Why do they have to suffer? Why do they have to go through so many laws and cross the Red Sea and go through the Egypt and teaching all those things? Because here we are, currently in my place, I have a group of people, they call them the thief people, who they are currently being massacred in Benue State by the Fulanis in Nigeria, in the middle belt of Nigeria. I have friends that are there, and I grew up among these people, and I know so they have a very strong culture, a warlike culture. They are very, they are warriors, most of them. They stopped uh, Ottoman Danford, the way he took his jihad in Africa, they stopped him. So these people are being massacred currently, and they have a folklore, a traditional folklore, that they pay an oral tradition that they pass through to their children from children to children. They said, according to them, that they were coming from the East, which is practically Egypt, but they didn't mention that they were coming from the East because there was war that was coming from the Arab, from the 
east that were coming and they were killing a lot of people. So the ancestors decided to move to the west. As they were moving, they reached to a place where there was a huge river, which is the current river, Benway. They couldn't cross the river. So a talisman among them decided to perform some magic and all of a sudden there was a green snake that appeared and the, the, the green snake now became a bridge that they used to cross River Benue to the other side of the city, which they settled currently in Nigeria, and they are there. Yeah. So this folklore is really interesting. They transmit these stories from children to children, and the children believe these certain things. They believe that it was real. They believe that it happened actually historically. There's no need to doubt it. How, you know, how did they cross River Benue to become where they are currently? And then there's another man again, I don't know, Jacob, I think, where saw in the Bible, who woke up somehow one day, probably uh, found himself. And the children saw that his father, their father was, had a broken leg. He has a knee that is broken. He had a fracture on his leg, probably, and he wasn't walking straight forward. When they asked him, he told them that he fought with God that he wrestled with an angel, and, and that was why he was blessed. So this narrative, this folklore, this tradition, these stories is something we see replicated in every tradition, in every group of people, in every clan, among different kinds of people. They have their narrative about God. They have their narrative about life. They have their own. So the question, the salient question here is how, why will he? Because if we, you know the history of how Christianity came to become universal religion, it was a clannish religion. It was a clannish tradition, a clannish culture. It was a clannish religion, a superstition for a group, a specific group of people until the Roman Empire took it as a huge campaign on them. Until it was enforced on the people in the kingdom by a pagan emperor who claimed that he saw the cross of Jesus Christ when he was fighting the battle. So it, if, it was, if it weren't for him, I was, I would, I, I'm still wondering what would have been the future of Christianity. Would it have Christianity spread in such a vast way? So he, Emperor Constantine now picked this little Jewish folklore because the, the Roman Empire then was a, was a, a, a polytheist uh, uh, society. So now he now forced them because there were a little group of people that were practicing Christianity, and Christianity was growing in, in a very large force. So now they pick Christianity, they enforce it in the kingdom, and now with the coming of the European, they found out that, okay, he introduced this, uh, this religion to the rest of the European, the Frank here, which, are the, which is currently the France, and to the rest of the people. Now they see that this religion is actually charming. They see the narrative in it. Now they picked it up. They refined it, they translated it from, 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 from Hebrew to Greek language, the Latin, I think. Then now, until recently, how it was translated to English language, which they use actually to take out this campaign to dominate the rest of the world, which they brought this religion to Africa 500 years ago, to Africa, I mean, black, when I say black Africa, I mean black Africa, because if I, to, to the best of my knowledge, the Christianity was, there was actually a, an old version that was already in existence in Ethiopia already. So they brought this to black Africans, this kind version of Christianity. They refined it, they polished it in a certain way. They, the, the, the collection of the books, uh, have been selected to be able to be, you know. So in this aspect, we discovered that there were certain books that were actually missing in the Bible. Currently, there is a debate. They are asking questions about the books that are missing in the Bible, that the Bible, by the, the, the uh, through the Nicene Council that they did, they, co they collected the art works of literature, testimonies of people to combine to form the specific Bible to, to bring that. So they uh, promoted this religion through the campaign through Emperor Constantine. Now, so I'm still wondering if Emperor Constantine, if he wasn't here to be able to, 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 to take this campaign further, what would have happened? And why does God have to go through this tedious work of making people commit huge genocide? Because some of the stories that are in the Bible are absolutely absurd, particularly most of the stories because of the genocide that they committed. And for, for instance, the, the, the story of, of Elijah or Elijah killing 42 children because they mocked him that he had a, he had, he had a bad hair. So we see stories of a group of people, of a little clannish people, and to the extent that the religion was be able to be, somebody took this religion, universalized it, and that's what we have today. So this question, this little literature, why do you still at it? Why do you think it's more plausible than the thousands of religions? <laughs> very, very, very good, you know. You know, that th thing you are talking to me right now, you are telling me the understanding, the philosophy of Amer an Africa-centric 
philosophers, the, these uh, new Negro African uh, black philosophers who are trying to rationalize why you know Africans must go back to their own God, that they have their own God and their own faith, and that uh, you know Christianity is a religion of colonization and it's a religion, religion of oppression, and they are the ones who brought slavery and Christianity was killing. I mean, the Bible, there are killings in the Bible and all that. It was, it is a very myopic, simplistic. Uh, understanding of, you know, uh, what we call deletant, the, you know, people who are, who are not professional, amateurs. It is a, it's a very amateuric approach to understanding the Bible and the God of the Bible. Now, let me now give you a wider concept of the Bible and the God of the Bible and the God of the Jews. Now, when you talk about the thief people, or ethnic people, or Yoruba people, or Igbo people, every nation, every nationality, every tribe has got their own understanding of God and how God helped them, how they came across. For example, in Yoruba land, in Yoruba land, for example, the Yorubas believe that life on earth started in Ife. And that, you know, they, they have a whole theory or to do a brought some piece of land, I mean, all that, you know, of God came from, from heaven, all kind of, you know, things they, they have that uh, they are more like, um, like, what do you call folklore, like uh, stories, like, you know, yeah, just legends. So, but why should God go through that pain? of revealing himself through the Jewish people. First of all, if we are to go by the account of the Bible, God existed before the Jewish people. And God related with man before the Jewish people. The Jewish people and God's choice of the Jewish people was an attempt by God to restore the general understanding and relationship that was already there, but was lost. It is because man lost relationship with God and when the, man went its, its own way and all nations went their own way, including the, Jew, the descendants of the Jews. Everybody went astray. That is the same thing, you, the same story you are telling right now about the uh, thief. The or, thief. Uh, thief. The thief. Uh, is it thief? Thief and the or any other ethnic group is the same kind of story that the descendants of the Jewish people were also telling. They also used to believe. They have everybody have their own unique stories, but stories like that also they were just like that. So the Jewish people were never. You know, they didn't come up with an idea of this God. And they too were paganistic. What you just described now was paganism or, or polyatism. That's what the Europeans and modern scientists like to call paganism now. They don't want to call it paganism, but they call it polyatist. Huh? Polytheism. Polytheism, right? Not monotheism, but polytheism. But I call it rather the Gentiles or paganism. Everybody was a Gentile. Everybody was a pagan, which means they were believing in different, different gods. So this old world that we have right now was out of order. When man left the, the, the Tower of Babel and they were scattered by languages, every language went and formed a nation and everyone had their own God and their own ways of relating to God. So it was a whole mess up system. So, for example, if God had not brought order into the whole process through Abraham, <laughs> can you imagine how many nations we have on the earth? Then can you imagine how many, how many not just nations, tribes? In Nigeria, I know we have over 250 tribes. Then many other countries have over 100 tribes. There will be thousands and thousands of different, different gods, millions of them. It will be just be chaos. And that then will even the more distort the mind of man from getting to know where he comes from. 
Because if we agree that we are all man, there must be a unifying factor. Because, okay, what then makes us man? What then unites us? What then makes us to be the same? What, 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 what we say men are equal? So if everybody has his own God, then men cannot be equal. We are, I mean, we are, also then we don't have the same origin. So how do we trace our origin? And if we are all men, white, black, any nationality, if we are all human, then it has to be traced to one single or singular origin. And if we believe that this is a higher intelligence that created us, so it has to be traced back to that intelligence. So that intelligence that we call God now decided to reintroduce himself to the whole earth. Now, Jewish people were practicing the same thing, just like the Africans. God is not a Jewish God. Okay. God is not a Jewish God. And this God of the Bible doesn't belong to the Jewish people. Only God had to start with somewhere, with somebody, or with a group of people. Why? Why is that necessary? Because the order of creation says that every big thing starts small. And it is only small things that become big. Things don't just start from nowhere. Everything must have an origin. But why, why is that important? It's because there must be process in reality. The idea is not just the idea of product or existence or matter. There must be process in matter. So because there must be process, the need for process in matter for example, why is it that we don't just, God didn't just let there be trees and we have trees? No. He had to go through the process of forming the seed. And he had to go through the process of making the seed go to the soil. Why? Because of sustenance. Not just sustenance by the trees themselves to be sustained or for God to maintain it, but because of sustenance for it to be easy for the man who is living on the earth to manage the seed and the trees. How will he manage it if he will not be able to study and there will be no predictability? There must be a process to it that man should be able to predict. There must be a process to everything on the earth that functions on the earth so that man will be able to do experiments, study, and be able to see the beginning to the end of it. That is how the earth was made to function. The earth is made to function in process. And because of the need for process, God introduced time and space. God introduced three things in Genesis. And the three things God introduced to make man understand process is time, space, and matter. And those three things that are necessary, that is why everything has to start from small to big. And that is why there must be a process to everything. So the need to go and get one person to, to start the process of reintroduction of humanity back to the source is what we say was started with the process of Abraham being called and having to leave his own tribe as well. Where they were having, you know, po po uh, poly poly what do you call it? Poly Polytheism. Polytheism. They, were, they, were, they, were, they were actually practicing Zaratustra, Zaratustranism. Yes, but they were having different kind of gods as well. They were having, that, some of them were having different kind of gods. His own uh, uh, father was practicing the god of the moon, stars. And then the other people, the old nation might be practicing something just like Nigeria now in Yoruba land. You might say, oh, you have Odudua, but everybody, somebody is practicing Ogun, uh, Shango, the god of thunder, the god of the sun, the god of, you know, that's everywhere. So now, he also was taken from his land, and he was taken now to be reintroduced back to the source of all men. Now, Abraham was not, there were God Almighty, is not the god of Abraham. He is the god of all humans. But it was using Abraham as the process to reintroduce all humans back to the God of all humans. So that is a, is a process thing. That is why the Jewish people were... Actually, I would not agree to say that it is the Jewish people that were selected. I mean, that were, mm, that were selected to introduce God. I would rather uh, uh, use 
and apply the Quranic understanding better than the biblical understanding this day, in this case. My own understanding of God introducing himself to man is not just connected to the Jews. The Jews is just one lane on one lineage of Abraham. But apart from the lineage of the Jews, there was the lineage of Ishmael. It was Abraham. So when you see all the world, at the time of Abraham, even up to now, were still polyethic, were still pagan, or you know, Gentiles, were people who were worshiping different, different gods, many gods. But they, did, they were not in, con they didn't know. Everybody, why were they worshiping all those different gods? Because yeah. everybody could feel in their nature that there is a, somebody that created them, there is a need for them to reconnect. God saw through the need of all nations, of all little, little groups, attempting to find their source. So God decided to reach out to help them. Because some of them, in their attempts to reconnect, they call on God. Maybe God answered them. Maybe God helped them. He preserved them different ways. But then some of them will say it is the name. You know, that story of the snake that you spoke. You know, the Igbo people, there is, uh, I think they, they call them Aroshuku. There is a tribe in Igbo land that also believe in similar story. They believe that it was a snake, long snake. It's called, that one is thief, is green snake, but their own is long snake. And the long snake is what preserved them and the, what, what God used to do their miracle as well. So, but two kind of different stories. Some people say it's snake. Some people say it's thunder. Some people say it's iron. Some people say it's... So God, to remove that confusion, God decided to introduce for the first time through Abraham a monetic or mon mon monetist understanding of God. Monetist understanding of God, which is only one God. So when we talk about God and Christian God now, I am not in a hurry to say yeah, that that is the Jewish God. No. I will say the God of Abraham. As far as I'm concerned, the God of Abraham is a monotheist God. And that monotheist God is the God that came, is the God that everybody is reconnected to, that immediately reintroduced himself, not just to the Jewish people. He actually started introducing himself to the Arab people. So the true Ishmael, because Ishmael was born before, before, before Isaac. And actually Ishmael, the covenant, there was a covenant between Ishmael, between God and Ishmael, before there was a covenant between God and Isaac. So that way it is to, is, is to be able to, uh, no, is to be able to, you know, deliver us from uh, accusing God of being unfair. We cannot say God is unfair and God is only chosen Jewish people because it's not true. He shows Abraham. And Abraham became the God of the Jewish people. And Abraham became the God of Ishmael, the Arab descent, the Asians. And Abraham became the God, the source of that. So it was parallel. Parallel history. So as a result right now, there are three monotheists religion in the world, which is, and they are the biggest, which is also pointing to the fact that all that is, is proof that it is true because the largest group of people, I mean, two billion Christians, two, one and a half billion Muslims and the Jews, all that put together is the biggest, that is like, you know, almost four out of seven billion in the world, almost four billion uh, are belonging to people of Abraham descent. What does that mean? It means that the majority of humanity now associate themselves to connect to that same source, the God of Abraham. So I would rather say it's not a Jewish God, but it's the God of Abraham. Because it is parallel. It is a parallel story of the Jewish and of the Ishmael. And even though we were not being, we were not seeing what happened to Ishmael later on in the book of, in the Bible, but, you know, the, you, I mean, Islam, we could say they are the continuation of that story. So I would say Abraham is a unique person that was chosen by God to return all men back to God. And not just the Jewish nation, but the Jewish nation, the Arab nation, and the nations of the earth through Christ Jesus now.
All right, it is actually an interesting narrative. As you said, as you were talking, I could relate because I, I actually read about the story of Ishmael and how the, the Arabs came to believe that, in, according to the Quran, they believe that the Ishmael is actually, since Ishmael is the first child, they believe so much in him. And then if you read continuously to the end of how uh, his mother was sent back in, at, from, by Sarah, by uh, the husband, you see that before Abraham died, he blessed them. He yes. blessed the two children. Yes, and that he, is the he, problem. He that is the problem that Christians have today. Christians today don't believe that we believe in the God of Abraham. That we, the Christians and Muslims, believe in the same God. That's a problem. Because we actually believe in the same God. And the reason why we believe in the same God is that this same God didn't appear to Abraham differently. This God didn't appear to Ishmael differently and to Isaac differently. No. In fact, God didn't appear to Ishmael or Isaac. He appeared to their father. And their father is one person. And that their father gave birth, that same God that appeared to their father, gave birth to two sons. It's just like me now. I gave birth to two sons. One here on this hand and this hand. And then you say, no, this other son, I am not the one who gave birth to him. No, but God made sure that Abraham never sent Ishmael away without blessing him. And Abraham demanded from God that God should bless his son and that God should enter a covenant with his son. Because even though God was saying, I'm going to choose uh, Isaac. I'm going to choose Isaac. The reason why I choose Isaac is not because he, I'm choosing the Jewish people. That's the mistake Christians are making today. We think that God has chosen the Jewish people over the Arab. No. The reason why, the only reason why God chose you know, Isaac is because God foreknew that the rest of the nations of the world, they will also need a source to be connected to Abraham. And that source has to come also from somewhere. So that source is Jesus. And God, because God knew that that source, because the Jewish nation is just one nation. The Arab nation is just one nation. But God is interested in all these other groups that you are talking about. So because of that, God had planted a seed. That a seed will come out from Isaac. That's why he said I chose him. It's because of the importance of all nations to God. God values all nations so much that he needed to create a source, a connection to Abraham the, that, that knows it's only God. Okay, Arab already have their own connection, Ishmael. Jews have their own connection, Isaac. But this counter connection will be different from the Jewish connection. Even though biologically he came from the Jewish people, is Jesus, but God put his blood in Jesus so that the Jewish people cannot claim him. It got to the extent that even the Jewish people had to reject him because the, for God, the, the need to save all other tribes and all other groups is not just as important as the need to save the Jews. It's not just as important as the need to save the Arabs, but it's even more important. For God, it's a more paramount question and a more paramount challenge to save the nations of the earth. That is why he said he was now choosing Isaac. So that through Isaac, all the nations of the earth will be saved. But he was actually seeing Jesus. Because Jesus is that son through whom the whole earth was saved. Not through Isaac, but through Jesus. So since he came through the lineage of Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that is why God will actually endure the fact that the Jewish people have been removed from the place of the priority. They've not been replaced, but they've been removed. That's why Paul was saying that it is like the, the Gentiles have been grafted in. And the, the branch that was the, the, the sole branch before. But that was before all nations were the great. Everyone was open to all nations. That was when the Jewish people were the main one and they could feel like they were in control. But once the bigger cloud of all nations of the earth, 80%, 90% of the earth was coming in, God will even go to the extent 
of allowing the Jews, the branch of the Jews, to be temporarily, you know, sidelined so that the bigger nations of the earth will be grafted into Abraham's roots and into God. Because what was primary concern of God is that all nations, not just Jewish nations. But if Christians and Muslims don't understand this, and even if Jewish people don't understand it, Bible will keep on being a source of division. Bible will keep on being a source of war. Bible will keep on being a source of you know, conflict to the rest of the world. Now, when you now started talking about Bible, killing in the Bible, and the, you know, and the killing all the Jebusites and the Canaanites, and that, that is part of our history. Because we, we come from that root. But that is not our history. It is the history of the Jewish people. But the, Jew, the history of us, not we Christians, but all nations of the earth, started with Jesus. It is the, through Jesus and the, through the times, and from the times of Jesus, that the nations of the earth took the center stage. And the Jewish people who were in the center stage in the Old Testament, they took the back seat. Because they would not join themselves to become one and with the nations of the earth, God would rather have all the nations of the earth to, to be leading. So our history is not contaminated with blood. Rather, the history of Christianity is such that God, our God, that brought us in and grafted us in into this tree of Abraham, he was the one who shed his blood for the sake of forgiving us and redeeming us for all the blood that all our grand-grandparents have shed in their various tribes and nationalities and nations. They needed, we needed forgiveness. And that forgiveness has to be on the level of a blood. Why? Because every tribe before Christ came were killing their children. So for you to accuse or anybody, atheists, to accuse the Jewish people of killing people in the Bible, then they have to present to us argument that there was any nation that killed less people. Because even the killings that you see in the Bible is not compared to the killings you see in the Quran. And in the killings you see in the Bible is not compared to the killings you see in the history of the Chinese people. All nations were bathing in blood. The one you see in the Bible is one of the most conservative one. But, when, but that is even with the Jewish people. But the, even so, it, it's the same God. But everything was leading to the path and to the time when God could say, the days of ignorance are past. When God could say, every one of you nations that were killing yourself in blood, let me now send the blood of my son that will forgive and redeem all of you. So that all of you now, who, your past will be washed. Both you who are accusing the God of the Jews for killing people, you are killing people too. You too will be forgiven. But, and the Jews also who are killing other people and people, they will be forgiven. And the people who are killed too who are killing other people will also be forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. It's a new era. It's a new dispensation. That's why Jesus portrayed a different image of God. Because nobody ever saw God. And he came to reveal the totality of God. But the God that we see in the New Testament, it is the reality of the then fallen nature of man and world in general. It is just because it was well documented and recorded that we could judge them. If every other tribe had also been documented like that, the judgment would have been horrible. But when Jesus came, the bloodshed stopped in Europe. When Jesus entered into China, the bloodshed stopped. When Jesus entered into Africa, the bloodshed stopped. He has shed his own blood one time so that all bloodshed will stop and all nations will be united to their maker through their, the Abraham, the man that was chosen by God. Okay, that's, that's really, 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 I'm always impressed with your narrative. You always come up with something different, something new, something different from what I've heard. From the explanation you just gave now, it's really, really interesting because I observe that the, in three accounts in the Bible, God, in the account in the Bible, he always favored the second child. For instance, in the case of Ishmael, Cain and, and, Cain and Abel, he favored the, the, another, the second child. And then when you come to the case of I, uh, Jacob and Esau, you see that the second child is actually favored. You come to the case of Ishmael, 
and Isaac, you see that the second child is also favored in this different account. And but, you but say in, something but, like, but in the case of Mary and Joseph, Jesus, the first child was favored. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> and you also say something about uh, the, the Arabs, because it's interesting to see that you know these things, because the Arabs, they know it very well. They claim it fully that they are the direct descendant of Ishmael. And it's also, it's also interesting to see that Abraham, the blessings he placed on Ishmael was that he will end his life through bow and arrow, and that he will trample upon that his, his enemy will be under his feet. So I was wondering if this explained the violent nature of the Arabs currently, do they are going to, because that was the blessing that Abraham actually placed on Ishmael. And then he blessed Isaac and said that you, that you, you see it, shall inherit the world. He placed it, he, he said you will be father of nations. He just placed that blessing on. So he placed blessings on two different children, which if you look currently, you will see that this specific children, this the same Islam and Christianity, the you will see that that blessing is manifested in a different way. You will see that the Muslims are aggressive, they are violent in their way, because that was the blessing that Abraham placed upon Ishmael, which one cannot argue against that. You also see that Isaac, you will see that it, it came out differently. So it's actually interesting to see that you know this perspective, you understand how this thing works. So the question still remains, it's still fascinating what you explain, how God, I guess, will never get to understand why he chose to, to reveal himself in such a manner, to reveal himself through a group of people using Abraham, trying to find, create a new covenant with humans. It's, it's really interesting. I guess we'll have to take it that way, as you just said, or we'll keep on debating on it until... Uh, uh, um, I don't know, because uh, I was wondering why didn't he just appear somewhere in the cloud, you know, some kind of powerful force. But no, we, it has to come through literature. It has to come no, through. No, 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 no. That is another question. Okay. If, if we have to find out why is it that God didn't just appear in the cloud, that would be an experience. God was very particular about oration versus, I mean, about written versus oration. When God appeared to Moses for him to record the first five books of the Bible, he told him to write down, write this down. In every other culture, by that time, the written tradition was not to even record history. Even some of them, like the Arab tradition had written tradition, no, yeah, some form of alphabet, Eastern, not Arab, Eastern tradition. Then the Chinese tradition had some kind of written culture. The Indians, some part of Indians had some kind of written culture. But they were not writing like for history, sake and for preservation sake but, but it was there but when you look at uh the way the he, he, you know, god instructed moses to write down the history of what happened the history of creation and everything you discover that in most of the other cultures it was mainly oratory narration oratory narration oral narration of history now oral narration of history is prevalent all over the world but what happens with oral narration of history is that it is easily forgotten when somebody is dead. So when, if God would have appeared like that, people who experienced that, they would die. Then when the people, they tell the story, everybody, if you tell four people's story, they would all they have different narration of it. Narration is a weaker way of preservation of history than written. So that is why God has to start with one lineage and get to a place where they, it could be written and recorded that in written form and that's why when we talk about christianity right now and the history of the jewish people it's one of the most systemized and you know organically structured uh written they have the most christianity for example new testament it has some of the most structured you no know, manuscript the, the seven thousand manuscripts are there. They are the oldest. They are the most widespread manuscript in history of any ancient writing now. Why? Because of, you know, God was more, God didn't want the connection to Abraham to be oratory. He wanted okay. it to be written. I, I guess I guess the question was And he doesn't asked. want it to be emotional. 
He wanted it to be systemic. That's why he said, I am sure that I will, he will teach his children the ways of the Lord. I am sure. I choose him because I am sure he will teach his children the ways of the Lord. That is system. That is predictability. That is, predictability. That is eventuality. But if it's just emotions and you no know, wonder signs, it is experience. It is it is it is subject to 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 emotions going there. It's not subject to feeling, to emotions, to narration, to you know, it can never be recorded. Okay, I guess that's where the the the, the confusion and the, the debate rises. Why I don't experience God like others? Why we have to believe other people experience. I think that that's where the, the, the question rises in the mind of an atheist. Why do I have to believe somebody's experience? Why? Because the, 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 you have to understand the structure, the nature of an atheist mind. An atheist is a tremendous skeptic. Is somebody who needs evidence to believe something. So, I, 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 I he shouldn't, shouldn't believe another person's evidence. Experience. Well, uh, he shouldn't. Well, he, he shouldn't. I would not encourage any atheist to believe any other person's experience or, yeah, or, uh, you know, he shouldn't. He should get to a place where he will believe the evidence of his eyes rather than experience of anybody or that even his own experience. Let him believe the evidence, the facts of the evidence of his eyes. Okay, that, that's an interesting part. So you are now saying that the atheist should rather believe when they experience God and not to believe the Bible true, because the Bible appears to be somebody's experience, some, some group of people who experience God in a certain period of time, and then they documented what they, they are experienced, and then they transmit it, as you say, as you'd like to call it, a systemic system yes. that yes. is not transmitted to teach. But the and atheist... Uh, atheists cannot know God through another person's experience. And okay. he shouldn't do that. He should get his own experience. And that is the, the only reason, if you, if you re remember the word I started with, I started with the word model, and I started with the word, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what, uh, huh? Prototype. Prototype and models. Prototype and models. What are prototypes and models for? If the, the purpose of prototype and models is not for you to believe the experience of the prototype. Is for you to duplicate. Is for you to have a formula. You don't need to believe it. You need to look at the the way, the past, the principles, the formula, and it's the same principle that is still operational everywhere today. You cannot go to the laboratory without the formula. The two plus two is formula. One plus one is formula. Science is formula. Physics is formula. So, you know, mathematics is the formula. So what God recorded in its book, Bible, is a kind of formula. We shouldn't be looking at Bible as a book of experience. We should look at it as a book of formulas. Okay, that's an interesting perspective. Yes. Uh, I like that. I like that very much. So when, okay, you that, now, when you now follow the formula, you get your own experience. Ah, okay. Just like two plus two is four. I don't need to believe it. I just need to follow the formula. When I follow the formula, I get the same result. All right. <laughs> okay, that's, that's interesting. All right, this one is nice, leading us to the last question, the spiritual question. I hope those listening to us are able to understand the, the this this concept of God. Why why is this so so? In in the process, I didn't even ask the question, but you already addressed it. It was remaining two. Yeah, like uh, the, the last two questions is, is is having a real location where God resides or just an inner realm of consciousness, but you already addressed it in your past response. I hope the people that are listening understand. And then the last one is what gender and race can you ascribe to God? So you already addressed that too. You you, you started by explaining that God it so I don't know if we can ascribe a gender to God. I don't know, maybe you would like to speak yes. on that. Yes, Jesus himself answered that question that there will be no need for marriage or remarriage, or divorce in heaven. Why? Because there is no gender in heaven. Heaven is a higher dimension. It's a higher level of reality than the earth. It is in the earth when you are in the third dimension that you need body. And body 
it is I, it's, it is only a product of the of of the three laws that God put in place. Body and all material things, all matters as only the product of three things: time. Why do we need time? Because man needs measurement on the earth. Space. Why do we need space? Because man must be able to be stationary. Matter, matter must be stationary. For matter to be, if there is no space, matter will be flying. And human will be flying too. So God put the law of space in place. So it is that as a result of that, that time and the reality of time and the need for time came to existence. If not because of the need for matter to be stationary, there will be no need for time. And because there is time and there is space, that's why we needed matter. And because matter is physical, something you could see, and man also has to be matter because he has to be able to relate to all other matters. And because man himself is, is matter, that is also, you know, but, but as it has to, there must be some creativity to be able to uh, form some pleasure, some a, a moment of, you know, interest and some, some law of difference and some fascination into the gender of, you know, of man. But more than that, there must be a process of reproduction. And because of the need for the, for the pro, pro, reproduction process, that is why there is gender. But that is all, all those are now the consequences of space. Those are only the consequences of matter, I mean, of, of, of time and matter. So it is only because of, but what makes God superior to all that and why men cannot or attempt to understand God in this space is because he is not, he created those limitations. Because he wanted man to operate in the world of matters. Physical thing, tangible world. Because he created that, that's why he put space in place. And he put time in place. So that everything will be stationary and measurable. So that there will be measure, measurement. But because he is not coming from that realm, he's coming from the realm of this way. There is no need for physical thing. No need for station. No need for stability, no need for tangibility, no need for time, no need for space. He is out of space. That's why it belongs in the world of the spirit. Okay, that is really interesting perspective. So you're trying to say in essence now that God is not affected. He, he lives outside the realm of matter, time, and all those things. Yes, so he's not affected by the limitation he set for humans. Okay? No, 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 no. That, that is very, very, very clear. And it's really, really, really interesting. So we cannot say he has a gender certainly no. because if he's not limited if he, yeah. if he if he's living outside the law he created yeah. we cannot ascribe a gender and i'm um, trying to imagine this, a picture of god in my mind i don't know if he is not superior mm. and outside of mm. the realm of matter and space and mat you no know, and time that he created he will not be able to create them You've got to be superior to any product you create. There's no way for you not to know how to do something and then do it and make it intelligent. So for you to be able to come up with that thing that you have written, this book from the beginning to the end, he said, why losing your job is the best thing that will happen to you? That is a logical you know, statement. And this which is being proven here logically. For me to be able to, why is it that nobody else has written this book? Why is it that everybody is not writing that book? Why would nobody ever write it? Because there must be somebody who has superior, who is over that situation, who controls, who knows better, and who could come up with that thing. So if I don't know, if I'm inferior to it, or I'm on the same level, I would never be able to give... You cannot sign, physics also say, any problem that is... You know, this is, uh, this is Einstein that says it. Any problem that is, on, that is existing on any level... For it to be resolved, that must, it must come higher. It's, it can only be resolved on a higher level. It is only something that is higher that can resolve something on any level. So for the earth to exist and for the for, for time, for human to exist, there must be somebody that is higher in intelligence than the level of existence that we have. That's why we have what we won't have in the first place. 
Okay, it's 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 really it's really really interesting, and I hope many people understand get to, get to understand this all this explanation you give, and it's also fascinating the way the point you just raised now. I'm trying to see it in another angle, uh, because it, it brings us back to the beginning of the question of the, the first question we asked about the, the the concept of God, and now we have a God that is that exists outside the realm of humans. We have a God that is not influenced by the laws of nature, by matters and all this time and space and all this. But when we see the concept of God presented to the Bible, we see a God with emotions. We see God who regretted creating humans in the first place because they fell, they failed in the Garden of Eden. We see God who has certain emotions, and this, some of these emotions we are recorded in the Bible. So that also, in this aspect, still challenge this concept of this transcendent energy, this power, that's this why, God. That's why you must go back to, to my explanation of the Bible. Okay. That what you have in the Bible is written in terms and conditions that is suitable and understandable by the people it's directed to. If you, you are reading that thing you have read in the understanding of man, in man's understanding, if, you are going, if God is going to come to give you his own understanding, you will explode. It's too small. It's just like saying God trying to bring the five, five, 500 billion galaxies into the head of any man. He's going to burn up. Even not even galaxies, let's like sun. It's just like throwing man into the sun. One, one star. Man will disappear. He doesn't want to kill us. That's why he comes to our level and gives us in our own terms in our own feelings, in things we could relate to. Understanding that you see in the Bible. Bible doesn't, rep doesn't represent God fully. And it doesn't talk, reveal God fully. It's just a little element that is needed for us to manage the earth, to relate to ourselves, and to relate to God. Okay, that's interesting. And I hope this explanation is is, is really satisfying to those who are listening. And uh, uh, it's it's really interesting because you are saying this. I'm not sure other pastors can be able to say the same thing. They, they will believe that the, the Bible is, is finite, is uh, uh, infinite, I mean. And it is explains everything about God. Not, they ignore the fact that science does exist. And he was able to, for instance, uh, I think I think it is one of your teaching or something you were saying. I can't remember where I get this from. Uh, you were saying something that yeah, I think it was one of your teaching. You were saying that when God actually said, "Let there be light," he it wasn't all about the sun and the moon and the stars. It was uh, he was actually talking about electricity. That uh, it was just there for a man, for the man to discover it one day to just come up, scavenge these things and bring them up together. So this knowledge are there and people will get to see them, get to understand them. So I believe we, we have already, already addressed these five questions of spirituality, the nature of God, first of all, how he operates, where he lives, and I hope that this uh, explanation is satisfying. I couldn't mind you already won me. She said we have an hour and 30 minutes. I see we have exhausted that time, only answering the spiritual aspect of yeah, it. I don't we, know. we will do part two, part three, okay. sometime in the future. All right, okay. So to our listeners, I hope you uh, will, will go back and watch the comment that they leave and see their contribution. And I've already posted the, the, the video in the in the other group, and I hope to see what they have to say about it. And I want to encourage a lot of people that are watching and they are listening that this is not this is just an aspect. This is just one aspect of the pursuit of the ideology you're seeing. I call him to address these things, but there is some there are a lot of things you will have to discover about him. He's not just all about spiritual. He's not just about religion. He's more than that. He's more practical. He's into economic transformation. He has done a lot of things in Ukraine so that you can be able to describe these things yourself. You can be able to see these things because personally what attracted me to you in person wasn't about Christianity. It wasn't religion. It wasn't that I was seeking to know. When I saw you, the first thing I saw was the love you express in your ways. And then when I came to discover a lot of things about you. I saw that you were uh, there was more to discover. You have certain things. You were you had the answers to to, to 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 a lot of the questions I was asking. For instance, one of the huge aspects you brought about was the Nigerian Transformation Program, which was very huge for me. 
it was a huge burden. I, I remember sometimes I'll just stay. Personally, I felt powerless. I felt very little. I was, I just keep having this pain in my mind. And I was having this French lady that was around. I was telling her that you people make you, you people evolve a lot. There was this quick evolution among the Europeans. You see, they, they started slavery, they abolished it themselves, they started a lot of atrocities. They keep evolving. They, were, they enslave women. They say that women cannot talk to men in a certain way, but they evolve quickly. Their community is evolving quickly, but Africa remains stagnant. We're not moving any further. So that pain was in my mind. I was so much in pain all the time. I, I just go sick. I just feel as if there's something I can do about it. What can I do? I wanted to understand my identity. I wanted to understand my nature, my background, my community. Why is racism? Why are black people suffering in America? Why are they suffering in Africa? Why are they suffering everywhere? So, but you, he, in your person, you come with different versions of Christianity that offer a solution to this problem. Like I said earlier on, you said in one of your messages, you said, faith is an asset. And people, I've seen people with faith who somebody believed that he will go into the lion's den and then nothing will happen. This happened in Africa. He had this faith in his mind, a pastor. He almost got killed by the lion until he was saved afterward. So I've seen people with, with faith who did a lot of crazy things. And I've seen people with faith, they use their faith to, to, to change the world. For instance, like Martin Luther King Jr., he used his crazy okay, it's time. What I do to okay. She's signaling us. All right. All right. Okay. 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 We, you okay. fixed time for the part two. My yes. well, thank you so much. I for think the they will arrange it. They will arrange for the part two. If if there are other questions concerning part one, we'll finish part two. Let them gather the question of part one. Let's go to part two. Finish part two. Let them gather the question. Then finish part three. Let them gather the question. Then we'll come back for questions and answers. All right, okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. All right, thank you. Bye. Good, very engaging, very productive discussion. You are a thank great, you. great conversationist. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Very honored. Thank you. If anyone doesn't believe in God, huh? I look after them. They don't believe in God. What? <laughs> That it was talking. If anyone doesn't believe in God, I think now they will. You think so? Yes. Are you sure? Absolutely. Yes. What do you think? What do you think? Simple yes. as that. If you don't believe in God, after listening to this, that's it for you. You're just going to believe in God. It's just as simple as that. Yeah. The explanation is so clear. What else do you want? Yeah. Even from the first question. answer, it's like, oh, I'm done here. Goodbye. Yeah. God mm -hmm. doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, and I can't get over it. even when you explain, you were explaining that, you know, the person that... But it is, but I'm talking about who invented it and the ones I converted. I'm not talking about...